gold fever swept through the Wild West faster than a prairie fire. It was a time when men, young and old, all dreaming of striking it rich with just a pan and a whole lot of hope. But let me tell you, gold mining wasn't all glitz and glamour. It was tough, back-breaking work with risks as big as the rewards. So saddle up as we mosey on down memory lane to see what life was really like for those gold hunting pioneers. It's January 24th, 1848, and word spreads faster than a jackrabbit on a hot griddle through the saloons and streets. There's gold in them California hills. This ain't just any old tale, it's a siren call, loud and clear for folk from every nook and cranny of the land. You got seasoned prospectors, farmers tired of tilling the same old land, merchants eyeing a quick fortune, and even greenhorns who ain't never swung a pickaxe in their lives, all packing up their worldly goods and hightailing it west. Now this journey ain't for the faint-hearted. Those heading westward faced a trek rougher than a cob. Some braved the mighty Mississippi, steamboating their way to Missouri before hitching up wagons for a grueling journey over the Rocky Mountains. Others, with salt water in their veins, choose to brave the capricious seas, sailing round Cape Horn, or risking the malaria-ridden jungles of Panama. When these fortune seekers finally lay eyes on California, it's like nothing they ever seen. Hills and valleys, as far as the eye can see, shimmering with promise. Mining camps sprout up like dandelions after a spring rain, a chaotic jumble of tents, shanties, and all manner of make-do dwellings. The air's thick with the clang of pickaxes and the slosh of gold pans in the river, as streams of folks, shoulder to shoulder, sift through gravel and mud, all dreaming of striking it rich. The rivers where this gold fever plays out ain't the tranquil streams you'd picture. They're teeming with folks, each with a glint in their eye and hope in their heart. Every pan of river silt holds the possibility of changing their lives forever. And when someone strikes it lucky, hollering out, Eureka, it sets off a frenzy with everyone's heart beating faster, thinking they might be next. But it ain't all sunshine and rainbows. This gold mining is back-breaking work. The easy pickings near the surface dry up quicker than a creek in August. And what's left requires sweat, grit, and a good dose of luck. And don't get me started on the lawlessness. With the rush of folks and lack of order, mining camps often turn into hotbeds of gambling, duels, and all manner of vice. Yet in this wild and untamed landscape, there's a sense of freedom and adventure that you can't find nowhere else. Fortunes are made and lost quicker than a hand of poker, and life is as raw and real as the earth under their fingernails. And you see, when that gold fever hit, it wasn't just a call for one kind of folk. No, sir. It was like a grand old hoedown where everyone's invited. You had your seasoned miners sure as the sun sets, but alongside them were folks from every walk of life, farmers leaving their plows in the field, hoping for a better shake in them hills, city slickers from back east, wearing suits not yet touched by dust, dreaming of fortunes bigger than the tallest buildings they left behind. And it wasn't just the gents answering the call. Women too carved their place, many already skilled in work in saloons or brothels. They set up shop in mining towns, working in dance halls and peep shows. Some aimed to strike it rich themselves, marrying a prosperous miner or finding a well-to-do fella, changing their stars in the wild west. We're talking about folks from all over the globe too, mind you. Immigrants from lands far and wide, Chinese, Irish, Germans, Latin Americans, all thrown together, bring in their own dreams and hopes to the American frontier. Each person's dream was as unique as the paths they walked, some dreaming of wealth enough to fill a room, others just wanting a piece of land to call their own, or maybe sending a bit of shine back home to kin waiting on news from the new world. Hold it right there, partner. Subscribe and press the bell icon before you go any further. But let's not sugarcoat it none. This here, melting pot, wasn't always peaceful. Tensions between different groups could run hotter than a blacksmith's forge, with prejudices and misunderstandings sometimes spilling over into outright conflict. Yet in them hills and by them rivers, a gold miner's day in the Wild West was as grueling as it was hopeful starting before the sun peaked over the horizon and ending when it dipped back down. Let's walk through a day in the life of these hardy souls. 
Before the rooster even thinks about crowing, our miner's up, shaking off the night's chill. He stokes up the fire, brewing coffee strong as a mule kick. Breakfast ain't no grand affair. Maybe some bacon sizzling on the skillet, beans, or hard biscuits. All scarf down quick. As the sky turns a soft pink, it's off to the claim. He's toting his gear, shovel, pickaxe, and that trusty old pan. If he's got one, a cradle or sluice box comes along. He's ankle deep in the creek or digging into the hillside, eyes keen as a hawk for that glimmer of gold. Now the sun's beating down something fierce, but there ain't no rest for the weary. It's all about sifting, digging, and a whole lot of hoping. Lunch is a quick bite, nothing fancy, eating right there in the dirt and dust. Shadow starts stretching, but our miner's still at it. He's washing and sorting through his day's haul. On a good day, he might find a nugget or two, but more often, it's just tiny flecks of promise. With the daylight dying, it's time to pack up. He's heading back to camp, worn out, but keeping on. Evenings when tools get fixed up, or maybe he writes a letter back home telling about life in the mines. Supper's a warm affair, shared round a crackling fire. Stories and dreams get passed around like a jug of moonshine. If he's feeling up to it, he might plan tomorrow's dig or just stare into the flames thinking about home and riches yet to be found. When the stars are out, twinkling like distant gold, it's time to hit the hay. He curls up in his bedroll, dreaming of a strike that'll change everything. Let's hunker down and talk about the tools and tricks them gold miners used in their quest for riches. The most iconic and simplest method was gold panning. Miners used shallow metal pans, looking a bit like a pie tin, to sift through river sediments. They'd scoop up some mud and water, then gently swirl it around. The idea was to let the water wash away the lighter materials, leaving the heavier gold to settle at the bottom. It was a technique needing a keen eye and a steady hand, and while it was slow going, it was mighty effective in the right hands. For those looking to up their game, there was sluicing. A sluice box is a long wooden channel with riffles at the bottom. Miners placed it in a stream, shoveling in pay dirt. That's the gold bearing soil. The current of the water would carry the lighter material away while the riffles caught the heavier gold. This method let miners process much more material than panning alone. Similar to the sluice, rockers and cradles were wooden boxes with handles. They allowed miners to rock the device back and forth, using water to sift through more material than panning. These were particularly handy in areas where water wasn't abundant enough for sluicing. Now, this was for the big operations. Hydraulic mining used high pressure jets of water to erode mountainsides, releasing the gold within. It was a powerful method, but not without its problems. It caused significant environmental damage, washing away entire hillsides and clogging rivers with sediment. As surface gold became scarce, miners had to dig deeper, leading to hard rock mining. This involved digging into solid rock to reach the gold veins deep below the surface. It required heavy duty tools like pickaxes and dynamite, along with more complex machinery to crush the ore and extract the gold. Well now, gather around and let me spin you a tale or two about some of the most famous gold miners and their legendary finds in the Wild West. Let's start with James Marshall, a name that'll always be as golden as the sun in the Wild West skies when we talk about the gold rush. This fellow wasn't even looking for gold when he found it. It was the winter of 1848, and Marshall was building a sawmill for John Sutter up in Coloma, California. One morning, while checking on the mill's tail race, he saw something shining in the creek. Lo and behold, it was gold. Now Marshall and Sutter tried to keep it hush-hush, but word spread quicker than a rabbit in a coyote chase, sparking the great California gold rush. Fast forward a decade or so, and we hit the Pikes Peak gold rush. Prospectors flooded into Colorado, seeking their fortune. Among them was a fella by the name of Green Russell. In 1858, him and his party, including some Cherokee miners, struck gold near what's now Denver. Their find wasn't the biggest, but it sure set off a rush that led to the settlement of Colorado. Now, here's a twist for you. We can't talk about the gold rush without mentioning the Comstock load. In 1859, two prospectors, Henry Comstock and Peter O'Reilly, stumbled upon a massive deposit of gold and silver in Nevada. This wasn't just any old find. It was one of the richest silver discoveries in American history. 
The Comstock load, as it came to be known, sparked a silver rush that drew thousands and turned Virginia City into a boom town. But it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, I'll tell you that much. First off, them miners had to wrangle with Mother Nature herself. Out in the gold fields, the weather could turn on a dime, blistering heat beating down under the noon sun, turn into bone chilling cold come nightfall. And if the sun and cold weren't enough, there were storms that could flood a mine in a heartbeat, or dry spells turning streams to dust, making panning for gold near about impossible. Then there was the land, rough and untamed as a wild bronco. Steep hillsides, treacherous cliffs, and rivers fast and cold enough to take your breath away. Many a miner found himself in a pickle, trying to navigate that wild terrain, hauling heavy gear up slopes slippery as eel snot. Now let's jaw about the dangers of the mining itself. Cave-ins, landslides, and tunnel collapses were as common as cactus in the desert, and just as unforgiven. And with tools no fancier than a pickaxe or shovel, accidents were bound to happen. Plus, them miners breathing in dust all day were prone to lung ailments, something fierce. But wait, there's more. In them mining camps, law and order were as scarce as hen's teeth. It was a free-for-all with claim jumping, thieving, and all sorts of skullduggery. Not to mention the saloons and gambling dens where many a miner lost more than he ever found in gold. It was a rough and tumble world where a man had to be as tough as nails just to survive. Now let's sidestep from the gritty day-to-day -day of gold digging and peek into the vibrant social world of them mining camps. Come evening, them mining camps transformed. After a hard day's work, miners gathered round campfires or in makeshift taverns, sharing tales and dreams over a bottle of whiskey or homemade brew. The air was thick with music, laughter, and the clinking of glasses, creating a sense of camaraderie among those rugged souls. Gambling was as much a part of camp life as digging for gold. Miners, flush with gold dust or down on their luck, flocked to the gambling tables for a game of poker, faro, or blackjack. Fortunes were won and lost in the blink of an eye, and the gambling dens were always abuzz with excitement and the hope of easy riches. Saloons and taverns were the heart of social life in the camps. These establishments, often no more than a tent or a rough wooden shack, were where miners came to unwind. They'd belly up to the bar for a drink, share stories, or listen to a tune played on a rickety piano. In a life full of hardship, these places offered a welcome respite and a touch of homely comfort. And then there were the brothels. In a world overwhelmingly populated by men, women, especially those offering company, were in high demand. Brothels, ranging from crude tents to more elaborate establishments, provided not just physical comfort, but also a semblance of normalcy and intimacy in the rough camp life. For entertainment, miners didn't have to look far. Impromptu musical performances, storytelling, and even theatrical shows put on by traveling troops added color and culture to the rugged backdrop of the mining camps. In these moments of leisure and enjoyment, miners could forget, even if just for a while, the backbreaking work and dangers that awaited them at the break of dawn. In these bustling hubs, born overnight from the feverish dreams of gold, a different kind of wildness reigned, one where the rules of the game were as shifting as the sands in the riverbed. Imagine a place springing up from nothing, where yesterday there was naught but sagebrush and today stands a town. Tents, shacks, and the first wooden buildings rise like phoenixes from the dust. Miners, shopkeepers, saloon owners, a motley crew drawn by gold, lay the rough-hewn foundations of what they hope will be the next El Dorado. Now, in these newborn towns, order was as scarce as a hen's tooth. With gold at stake and stakes high, it weren't long before chaos reared its head. Claim jumping, thieving, brawling. The law was but a whisper against a howling wind. But humans, being social creatures, crave order, and miners were no different. They began to band together, forming miners' committees, where disputes were settled not by the barrel of a gun, but by the voices of the many. But let's not sugarcoat it, none. When legal justice was slower than molasses in January, vigilante justice took its place. Men, masked by the anonymity of the crowd, took the law into their own hands. 
It was rough justice, often swift and brutal, a reflection of the raw edges of life in the gold fields. Yet, amidst this wild dance of law and justice, something remarkable happened. These ramshackle towns began to evolve, growing into communities with schools, churches, and even newspapers. What started as a chaotic rush for gold morphed into a striving for something resembling civilization in the heart of the wild. These towns, some that flickered out as quickly as they flared up, others that endured and flourished became the stuff of legend, a testament to the indomitable human spirit. In the crucible of the gold rush, amidst the clash of gold and greed, the foundations of law, order, and community were laid, shaping not just the towns, but the very soul of the American West. As we ride out from the lively streets of the mining towns and look back on the era of the gold rush, it's like watching a grand play of fortunes won and lost, of dreams made and broken. This was a time of great economic booms and busts, a roller coaster of rags to riches and riches to rags stories that shaped the very fabric of the American West. In the heart of the gold rush, stories of striking it rich were as plentiful as stars in the desert night. Fortunes were made overnight, with men and women turning from paupers to princes on the luck of a gold find. Saloons, supply stores, and all manner of businesses flourished, feeding off the wealth pulled from the earth. Towns like San Francisco grew from sleepy outposts to bustling cities, pulsing with the lifeblood of gold. But as quick as the boom came, the bust followed. As gold became harder to find, hope turned to despair for many. Those who came late or lacked luck found themselves clinging to broken dreams. Businesses folded, once thriving towns turned to ghost towns, and the stark reality of the gold rush's fleeting nature hit home. For every story of success, there were countless tales of hardship and loss. Yet for all its ups and downs, the gold rush left an indelible mark on American history. It propelled the westward expansion, bringing diverse peoples and cultures into a land rich with promise. It laid the groundwork for California statehood and its emergence as an economic powerhouse. The technologies developed for mining evolved and advanced, setting the stage for future industrial growth. The social and demographic changes were profound. The influx of immigrants during the gold rush shaped the cultural mosaic of the West contributing to the vibrant, diverse society we see today. And the spirit of the gold rush, with its ethos of adventure, risk-taking, and the pursuit of dreams, became embedded in the American identity. To be a gold miner in the Wild West, gold rush was to live a life of extremes, hope and heartache, riches and ruin, all under the vast, open skies of a land wild with promise. It was a dance with both fortune and fate, where every day brought a new challenge and the dream of a golden tomorrow. Now, I wonder, if y'all had been there panning for gold in them hills, what dreams would you have chased? Share your thoughts and any questions y'all might have down in the comments. Let's keep the spirit of the gold rush alive with our tales and ponderings.